By the end of the 19th century, the sharp divide that separated women from men in the labor force had locked into place. From an ideological perspective, men who either supported families or expected to do so believed themselves entitled to good jobs at good pay. Skilled men organized into trade unions to fight for reasonable working conditions. Women who were expected to have men to support them had only fragile claims to jobs. Their efforts to improve their working conditions often met a wall of resistance and demands that they find good homes reached deaf ears. The domestic code deeply ingrained in the gendered imagination played a role in these understandings. It identified women as attached to the home and when they were forced to work, it enabled employers to justify hiring women for less, thus discouraging women who did not need to do so from entering the labor force. The same ideology made it easy for male citizen workers who were meant to be breadwinners to exclude women from the best paying jobs. Men could simply not afford competition from low waged women. Employers would not hire women except if they could pay them less. By the end of the 19th century, women were routinely segregated into low-income jobs in which they earned from a third to half of a male wage. We call this occupational segregation, the segregation by sex of men and women. It was justified by nature and custom and seemed not merely economically serviceable, but entirely natural, a way to protect the home from the incursion of industry. Even this harsh division of labor did not keep women from wage work. From the late 1890s into and through the Depression years of the 1930s, between 15 and 20 percent of adult women found their way into the labor force at any one time. The numbers were much higher for African-American women because their menfolk were often excluded from good jobs or any jobs. Black women worked at more than double the rate of white women. No domestic code prevented them from searching for jobs. Economic necessity pushed them like many immigrant women into the unrelenting job market. There, they faced racial discrimination from white workers and employers that further exacerbated occupational segregation. Job segregation didn't diminish even as industrialization provided an expanding array of jobs. It was fostered by emancipation and mass immigration, which made available a large residue of women needing to work and willing to accept low wages and poor conditions. Domestic service, for example, remained the province of women, an arena that employed a third of all working immigrant white women and two-thirds of all African-American working women at the end of the 19th century. Office work dramatically expanded during and after the Civil War began as a male province and then turned female as it became clear that typewriters and adding machines could be more cheaply utilized by women. Department stores generally hired women to sell to women and men for executive positions. These positions went to more highly educated white women, adding yet another layer of segregation to the workforce. Educated African-American women could and did get jobs in teaching and the new field of nursing, particularly when their pupils and patients were African-American too. Law and administrative regulation confirmed women's secondary places in the labor force. The 14th Amendment provided the rationale for an idiosyncratic array of limits on women. In providing persons with due process and equal protection under the law, the 14th Amendment left open the definition of 
person. Soon, the courts would agree that racial difference did not exclude an individual from personhood under most circumstances. But the courts also decided that states might, at their discretion, exclude women from privileges granted to male persons. Each state was free to define who a person was and for what purposes. We've seen, for example, how states refused the right to vote to women who argued that the 14th Amendment guarantee against equal protection of the laws was meant to include them, too. And we note that Myra Bradwell was denied the privilege of practicing law by the state of Illinois because, as Justice Bradley wrote, the paramount destiny and mission of women is to fulfill the noble and benign office of wife and mother. This is the law of the Creator. These decisions, made by the Supreme Court and by the lower courts as well, immediately placed women in a different relationship to the Constitution than men. In a series of court cases culminating in 1908, the Supreme Court decided that, by virtue of her primary role at home and in motherhood, women might be excluded from particular jobs or treated differently from men. These regulations responded to the law of the Creator. How did this natural law play out in the lives of ordinary men and women in the period of mass immigration and post-emancipation? We'll focus on the ready-made garment industry, where next to domestic service, most women worked. We'll take a look at the daily lives, the lived realities, the experiences of the ordinary men and women who worked in the garment industry on New York's Lower East Side around 1900.